So um, I would like to thank you all for uh, signing in for to join me for lunch, and I would like to thank Carlin for organizing this fabulous venue. I'm also always very interested in joining other people's presentation because I learned so much about them. And uh, so my presentation is, uh, well, it's a second round and I've learned from my first one. So I've shaped it slightly different. However, uh, I would like to start with, ooh, sorry, <laughs> with now computer open up, please. There we go. With the following, now I am full screen and I don't see anybody anymore. Uh, but I, will, I would like to introduce you to my studio space with the following video that was uh, done by a videographer a few years ago. But it really gives you an insight of an atmosphere that I uh, have created in this space. <laughs> Patapouf. Venu de la verrerie, il dit toujours la vérité et se marbre seul dans ses disputés. En ce moment, le téléphone sonne tous les matins pour dire des trucs plus ou moins ce qu'on Il se coquérise, ce sacré patapouf. Venu de la verrerie, il dit toujours la vérité et se marbre seul dans ses disputés. And uh, that kind of says it in a nutshell of what's going on here. Um, and uh, for me to talk about my work is another story, uh, rather than um, um, showing you what I'm doing today, because there will come a time where these images will be visible as well, uh, and they will be out there. I'd rather, you know, the images will speak for themselves. However, what I would like to present to you is really something that's the guiding line, the undercurrents of what makes me going into the directions where I go. And uh, it starts from the very, very beginning of my early, early years, my upbringing uh, with a mother musician. And... Uh, Everybody is shaped at the age, you know, for the first seven years. And I think the music lessons that I experienced in my life certainly affected my understanding, my early understanding of what it means to read a note. Uh, I feel that I have learned to read uh, a note or music first before any other language, 
growing up in an environment uh, where I was exposed to four uh, spoken languages right away. Uh, as a child, they are also music, melodies, etc. So uh, the notation in each language is, of course, its own. But I think at the bottom line, when it's being spoken, it's another sound of uh, what uh, the vocal cords can transpose in the world of the ABC. So um, my reading lesson started really also in the work of notation, music notes. And, uh, and then also we had a music teacher come to our house three times a week. And he was a former renowned uh, conductor and he had music theory knowledge and also built uh, a uh, very uh, a theory in music his his own manuscript which I discovered when I visited him at his apartment and this piece was actually in the garbage can and I found it so beautiful because I noticed something else not only does he describe that uh, um, one has to beat the measure energetically uh, in uh, in music, if you can see my screen, there is the battement de la mesure, which sets the measure of uh, the sound transposure. Uh, but he also applied himself so beautifully in his handwriting, which to me is another form of drawing. So um, uh, over the years, uh, I have developed a love for books and obviously I'm surrounded by them. This is just a fraction that are piled up of uh, things that have uh, nurtured my path over the years and they keep on doing so. Um, and uh, uh, the, the actual effect of an open book on me has a way to calm me down, to bring me into my inner worlds. And uh, like a monk, I feel that way, uh, where I totally sit in stillness and uh, go in the world within. And then I'm exposed to these beautiful uh, pages that are uh, created so thoughtfully. Uh, and uh, I'm showing you examples of where other artists from other periods in time actually illustrate that in their works, the appreciation of the written word on paper and what it does to us, the beautiful expression uh, in their faces. So uh, my work really started to take shape after seeing many um, uh, uh, examples of other artists that started to draw writing. And uh, uh, so that is really where I started to tick. And after studying uh, semiotic, uh, the understanding that a note comes with a connotation, a notation always has a connotation. Like in music, you make a sound, it resonates. And uh, so when I look at this old um, painting, which is from the Middle Ages, look how beautiful the rhythm on the page, the simplicity of it that says it all. And I'm, I'm, I'm always struck by that simplicity. So uh, one thing that really had a huge impact on me is seeing at the, the um, um, uh, Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, a big exhibition of drafts of writers. And uh, I tell you, my knees were weak when I saw that. Um, so um, I just noticed that, the, well, the image of a, of a writer's example will come uh, within the presentation. Um, but we're being intercepted by actually an artist rendering of a text that he wrote um, and uh, making the visual uh, more appearing with all the, the scratch things that are, you know, the notes, the side notes, all the black marks. There is a painting coming for me that is coming together that really, uh, uh, you know, attracts my attention. Here we are, Victor Hugo. This is one of his drafts, of a manuscript drafts. Look at how the drawings, the, 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 the mindscape starts to take shape. And, uh, and here we have another one, which I think is really telling uh, the rhythm in the page of uh, Balzac, uh, and we're talking. This is this is something that uh, you know is being collected worldwide. These uh, manuscripts. The beauty of them is, uh, I find, uh, incredibly striking. Here is Juan Miro, who always plays between the worlds, image and word. 
And then we have the philosopher Roland Barthes, who wrote a book about uh, Le Plaisir du Texte, The Pleasure of the Text. And he has obviously a lot of pleasure with these marks as well. So it's really jumping out of the linear and playing around with the scribbles. And uh, we know that doodles go a long way. So here we have uh, a lovely uh, ink drawing by Jackson Pollock. And then here, a simple sketch by Jack Bush, who then transposes it into large paintings. And uh, uh, those are the kind of things that marked me over time. The painter Olivier de Brie did extensive studies about how we have evolved in the thought space and how therefore we create space. So he started from the early uh, Stone Age up to the modern times and uh, he describes in his book on how we have evolved also in, in the, um, the use of a progressive sign. And then, of course, uh, musician and uh, visual artist John Cage is very much part of my life. And uh, he always uh, uh, impresses me. And uh, I always pay attention to the doodles. And here we have Frank Gehry's doodle that uh, started, uh, you know, it's the beginning of his uh, renovation program, uh, project uh, of the AGO. As we know, that's a realized project, but look where it started. Here is Olivier de Debré again writing a letter to a friend, a uh, poet, and he mixes image and words beautifully. So for me at the beginning, I started with the music note to understand the transfer from the visual uh, understanding towards rendering it into sound. So it really goes through my body as I, you know, the notation has to touch me somewhere. Um, the early practice of music writing, uh, I don't know how you feel, but uh, in the days when we were at the telephone and we had to take note of uh, something, a list to do, I found myself doodling on the side, making a little drawing, a flower or something like that. And it just goes to show how everything is interconnected. And that is really the basis of my work. I do not uh, try to make compartments right away into boxes, but I really like to uh, maintain an overview between all the different fields of information. And uh, so here I'm starting to develop my own uh, visual language. Uh, in various ways. I studied printmaking, that was my, what I majored in. So here we have etching and writing together, but I'm trying to understand the body of my own writing. What will, how does it want to look like? And uh, if you can try to remember the early shapes here, they actually reappear later on in my painting as well. So here we also, you know, I study the shape of a text page, what it can look like. And again, I play with the fact that early scribbles, it doesn't matter. Uh, they don't have to be shaped into any alphabet. It's just a gesture that counts. I've also dissected text and disseminated everything to be able to jump out of line, emphasizing the punctuation, the rhythm of space, and uh, try to um, uh, construct other topographies uh, are having taken apart <laughs> many books to understand how a book is built. And uh, as we know, a book is built with many signatures. So I'm playing around here, trying to dialogue with the construction of my own visual uh, distribution, the topography, the building of a text. And my gesture is starting to find shape as well. And here, uh, after dissecting so many texts, I discovered also the spaces between the words. Having studied typography uh, endlessly, I have also, uh, I've always been told the difference between an espace and un espace. Notice that there is a masculine and a feminine. In French, they differ. That is the space between the words. And without the space between the words, we do not obtain the clarity. But note how beautiful these lines show suggestive of another space, the image. I mean, I see curvatures, almost body-like spines. I mean, there is an information field of its own. And uh, while transposing a text halfway to discover the intrinsic uh, rhythm within all things, 
uh, I also was uh, using paper to clean up my uh, the, the fountain pen tip uh, where I was that I was working with and I discovered another shape of drawing coming into place and so I've been playing around making marks here is a simple brush stroke that I uh, studied with in uh, with gel and a little bit of pigment just giving me these unexpected moments to enjoy and just a few examples now on how uh, the painting evolved, you know, where I try to transpose my understanding from the paperwork into color, which I started to do when I arrived in Canada in 1984. So roughly speaking, it keeps on uh, evolving over time. Technique, I learn a lot with the medium, everything. The medium has a message as well, a famous saying, Marshall McLuhan. But I too am a medium. So it's really the intersection of three compartments, the visual understanding outside, inside, and then of course the medium that has a lot to bring as well within that terrain that is starting to build up. So um, in those days I stain canvas and then I used a little gel with oil, oil crayon. So um, the book shape has always been part of my life. So here we go as an example in 2002. And then I discovered uh, the uh, medium gloss gel that I have really explored over time uh, to render that sense of transparency that I'm always interested in. Something to look through, the looking glass, the famous layers, the multi-dimension the aspects that are uh, the hidden realms, etc. So here we have a painting that I um, uh, used for the cover of a book that I was invited to uh, put together in of writings that I started in 1984 upon arriving in uh, Canada, uh, where the languages that I couldn't speak on an everyday basis started to still make a lot of noise in my head and uh, especially the French language which I didn't get to use in Toronto a lot so I started to write things down and over time uh, started to observe and how my writing started to take shape uh, in the space of my new environment the double page obviously too as the book has always been an important part of my life and uh, so I've been um, uh, looking at building 3D objects, uh, the open book, building cases with uh, the help of uh, woodwork so that I can address the terrains that are starting to come towards me uh, more, uh, well, to make them visible. And uh, slowly uh, my terrain starts to define itself so much that the first reading that I was uh, offered to do was actually in Switzerland together with painting. So bringing those two environments together, which means a lot to me. Uh, and uh, so the work on paper continues to grow um, because paper has its own uh, magic and beauty and also uh, challenges me to use other medium uh, inks again and then also acrylic inks and crayons and all these wonderful tools to explore the scribbles, the suggestive writings of what uh, without words and come up with other compositions and then looking at details, I'm flipping back here, the bottom right, that one invited me to transpose uh, that type of scribble writing gesture uh, annotation into my work in painting. And uh, of course, the possibilities are endless. And um, there you see at the top, the reflection of the gloss gel allows me to make I superimpose many layers at once and then the shiny layers that I um, pour between the different layers allow me to create these holographic 3D or multi-dimensional um, uh, surfaces or universes. <laughs> so um, as the journey continues, I also discover another medium that allows me to apply crayon in a on canvas because the uh, the pastel actually sticks to the dry media ground which is a gritty surface 
So I've been exploring that over time. And here I'm reminded of some an, a manuscript that I got to see. It was a book of Limburg that they had dismantled, which of course interests me when that happens. And it was exhibited at the Met. And they had uh, placed it in frames and the light was shining through and they emphasized exactly what I'm always looking for is the translucence of the page and seeing the other side and seeing the image work, which I have explored uh, in paintings like this one on the right side, the dry media ground allows me to um, um, create fine layers that also show the underpaint, the undercurrents of many layers of uh, in painting and I do that on the right uh, on the left side with the simple color pigments as well interspersed with uh, uh, interference uh, pigments and uh, glass medium um, so we have a few examples like this double page again always uh, one of my favorite moments uh, the double page here is actually uh, a work on, in photography that I got to uh, explore thanks to a moment where we found a manuscript of mine that we had put in the garden, which is, uh, this is the leftover from a manuscript that I was writing. Um, and I had packed them in a box thinking that we would add them to a bonfire and release all this uh, drafts to the spirits. And uh, that fire never happened, but instead it's uh, the box stayed in the garden, got wet and uh, and started to decompose. So my composition started to decompose, which is fun to know that nature joined this creation. And when I opened it up, uh, this is actually thanks to my husband. So um, he called me in because on a warm December day, we thought we were going to make a bonfire and then he wanted to use these papers, but no. Uh, he discovered that and called me and I opened the treasure box and noticed that nature had started to paint in it as well. Look, and somebody laid eggs in there too. So that was also uh, a beautiful discovery. But uh, let's put them to use. So I decided to take photos that very same day. They were soaking wet so I could place them on my window uh, in the sunroom and the sun was shining in. So I took, I don't know, 300 plus photos. And some of them really, I put them to use. And so on the right side, uh, so the left side is unmodified. And the right side is another page that I joined with the left. But then I used the Photoshop and pushed it towards uh, a certain, this dimension. And I discovered that they started to look like the some of my paintings. So I put those two together and made a limited uh, edition of that. And uh, back to printmaking, I was offered to work with the um, in Toronto with a fine art uh, printing atelier, and uh, we made this series of serigraphs together, which is another working process. And this series is called the text is still unwritten, uh, the series of eight. And uh, here we are in Toronto with Robert Robert Game, uh, who uh, was leading the atelier with his wife Susan Farquhar. And uh, we created these uh, mylar uh, pieces and we created images like these, intercepting them in different orders on the light table. And they are the master printers. So I had to think ahead of time what colors I would like to have. But uh, they would then work until we meet again and then we would define the images as we went. So that took a year and a half. There are eight of them and these are a few examples. Limited edition, which is, uh, has been sold, by the way, all over the world as far as um, Taipei in Taiwan. So, um, and the, I think some are still available at the Eno Gallery, I believe. So, um, back to painting, dry media ground, uh, exploration of the scribble uh, as a sign, co-signing, creating... Uh, atmospheres that uh, you know they I don't know where uh, they come together slowly as I go sometimes I play with the notion of wanting to explain something but then you know the saying is let me draw your picture so that's kind of the base of this uh, painting um, Of course my work in typography has its other dimensions as well I play with transparencies 
and build sculptural elements, uh, which led me to um, create my second um, text painting. And uh, uh, this one, instead of putting it into a book, I decided to make them into large doubles uh, paged uh, scores, which we exhibited um, for the first time in uh, 2008. We had four at 2009 at the Inner Gallery. Um, this exhibition focused then on the text painting together, merging with my painting. Here are some, some examples, um, which later on you will see will also uh, inspire me to do either paintings or 3D work. So you see the mixture of nota notation, notes, the written, the, the uh, alphabet shapes, uh, and then the understanding of the visual placement, the typography uh, distribution of text. And um, uh, the exhibition also had an added touch, and that is um, thanks to Carlin uh, Moulton and the Inner Gallery, who um, invited uh, me to actually make a sound performance. And then we got together uh, with uh, Alex Samaras and Bram Gielen. We made a premiere performance and then two encore, uh, encore performance um, during the Prince Edward County Jazz Festival. And uh, uh, it was uh, a phenomenal experience every time. Uh, and here you see the scores that we were reading from, but on the walls the audience was able to look uh, at that at the same time while reading. The, uh, the result of it was, uh, for me, was an incredible experience because I was brought back to my first singing lesson, which is solfege, and here I was performing uh, as a visual artist our work in silence, and here I was using my voice. So this is a new uh, experience, and with the great support of Alex and Bram, uh, who are uh, fantastic musicians, uh, they, they offered me a great platform to dare that moment. So here we are, and it was great. And we pushed it, uh, uh, Carlin pushed it furthermore, and uh, then uh, we co-created a larger rendering at the um, uh, Region Theatre in uh, uh, Picton uh, during an, the next year's Jazz Festival. Carlin, do you want to say something to that? Well, it was interesting because at the very first performance, there was um, a fellow by the name of John Ottman, who's a wonderful choreographer, and he happened to be running the Quinty Ballet School that year. And so when John heard Elise's first performance in the gallery, he said, I have to dance this. I have to dance it. I need to choreograph it. And his wife, Martine, is a wonderful jazz dancer. They used to be a part of Lala human steps in Montreal. And so uh, they came together and that performance at the Regent, when we had um, all of these different elements of um, uh, music and voice, uh, we had um, uh, Christine Duncan, who is one of the most incredible Canadian vocalists that we've got. She's extraordinary. Uh, Vern Dorge, other people came together with Ottman and Martine. And honestly, it was transcendent for me. It was an extraordinary experience, and only six people walked out. So um, overall, I would count that a success. <laughs> it was a Indeed. bit of a stretch for, for the Picton Jazz Festival. They, they're a bit more used to, you know, they have big band kinds of performances. This sort of avant-garde, uh, very much out there performance, that really was a regression. If you let yourself go into it, it was like being one year old again. And the people that let themselves go into that and went through this regression to a very primitive learning how to feel your senses state, well, they were in tears at the end. And um, yes. uh, it was very powerful. And then I did another reading at the Trent University. I was invited by Jonathan Bordeaux, uh, who uh, runs the cultural uh, studies there. And uh, that was another interesting experience uh, where my voice was then the trigger for a uh, specially designed software program that rendered images on top of the score, which you see then in the projection uh, on this poster. Um, the uh, text work inspired furthermore um, uh, paintings as we go and again always exploring the double page 
um, and uh, uh, the scribble, the notation, the playfulness, uh, and uh, the exploration of the many layers on the left side, the hues, the color, and using color as a language this time. And then, of course, the marks and the lines and the layers. This is work on Myla that also emphasizes the, um, uh, the many layers of thought uh, and um, sign in the, and the progression of signs. So added color to it, uh, they become very playful notations. Uh, and um, uh, this uh, shows, again, the merging of uh, some Myla pieces together with uh, the painted works. Um, and the influence of typography on my painted work. And again, the typography here, I, I literally photographed uh, pages from my book Je and uh, transposed them, uh, enlarged them, transposed and made visual compositions via photography and mounted them uh, uh, that way on die bond. Uh, and make them look like, you know, at school in the early days, we would have these land, uh, th these uh, maps hanging on the walls that would, would teach us how to read. So that's, this is what reminded me, uh, this is what it reminded me of. And then we have uh, uh, the open book that uh, the, the very minimalist rendering of it, but how a few lines and a dot can go a long, long way. Uh, that book happens to um, uh, be used on the book at the risk of sounding, and I think that the title is just so perfect uh, together in, uh, with uh, this piece. And uh, uh, it came together with a retrospective, uh, a survey show at the McLaren Art Gallery uh, in Barry that was called The Cipher. There you see the original painting of the cover hanging on, uh, in the space uh, on the right side. And then the double page, uh, which continues to grow, uh, and uh, then was also exhibited at that, that show, and was used to create a conversation with children how to read. I love uh, the mind of a child because they still think as everything is one, there is no division. Uh, everything is, there is a oneness to it, and the freedom of the child uh, responding to the invitation to draw with words, uh, it, there is a lot of fun in this one. Um, I actually found it on the floor, so that was a, a treasure for me. Um, so here we have another example of how uh, the lineup of simple marks can create another atmosphere. And uh, uh, I live with these pages, uh, Gregorian chant books that uh, I found in an antique store in uh, Toronto. They were hanging on a clothesline, uh, sold for $20 each. And I said, oh my God, I have to take them all. So I have them framed at home, double-sided. And uh, the beauty of them is really, look at how beautiful they're composed and how the music note merges with the written. And Again, as a reminder to, before I continue, how beautiful, this is a, a medieval painting, how the simple lines can say so much about the written word. And my own typography work continues to inspire my painting, the next series, and I call these glyph graph, uh, where the, uh, everything that has informed me so far suddenly came out this way for a while. And I have a whole series that developed that way. Um, it's always exciting when uh, something new happens because it feels like, ah, there is another aperture so that I can dive into. But uh, it looks like it was announced a little earlier because in 2003, on the left side, I made drawings that way, already going, uh, you know, their works on paper mounted on a board and uh, later on in 2012, it came out on canvas. So everything is interconnected. So the, here's an example where I use, just because uh, I use, and I get to finish my sentence in a moment, but uh, I'm inspired by the illuminated pages, uh, medieval pages here. Uh, and uh, why not use illumination uh, since it is available in the acrylic Medium right now, I use phosphorescent paint, so when you turn off the light, 
you have another painting for a moment that shines there before uh, total darkness comes in. And then I also always play with the reflection of light using, uh, here I use a, a product called Liquid Mirror, which is also a new product on the market that I've been exploring uh, ever since its existence. Uh, I think it was at the time in uh, 2012, 14, somewhere there. But again, it brings me closer to my etching plates uh, at my, very, my early start in printmaking. And this is what this kind of uh, painting also inspired me to explore, is the aspect of printmaking. So the simple line that goes a long way and then building up textures and then having uh, the liquid textures, uh, you know, settle into some crevices and then you build it up with some more solid textures. And uh, these things emerged over time. And then again, the idea of having a book on a stand that you can stand in front and read from has always been, uh, has marked me over time. So I thought I'd create my own. Uh, and uh, that is uh, as an active portal, again, the invitation to dive into. So it's instead of hanging the painting on the wall, it's really nice to see uh, it uh, more on a, a flat or almost oblique flat position. And uh, the journey continues. Here you see a bit of my studio space again and uh, the exploration of texture and then maybe just let the color speak very simply uh, with all the uh, layers and, and the uh, subtleties that uh, the interference paint has to offer. And then how the text is being created by the air bubbles. And remember the early printmaking uh, aqua tint pieces that I showed. Here we have an example on how that same, similar gesture appears in the acrylic paint. And as we know, text always comes back. And then as you see the uh, right side, there is this uh, formation that uh, means a lot to me. It describes the core of my work. So I decided to also explore it in 3D and I made a letter sculpture uh, using uh, uh, working with a sign maker and uh, uh, car antennas and then also the special video projection paint that I used to uh, to emphasize the warm and the cold color that I was able to offer thanks to two video lights that I have in my studio here and I use these lights for the installation piece and uh, in special settings I was, uh, I was asked to make a special uh, installation piece for this particular space in Bowmanville at the Visual Arts of Clarington. And that allowed me to explore yet another dimension that I grew up with, the music stand, were very important in my life, the open book, the letters, the school, learning how to read, and just sitting there open-minded. And uh, uh, another situation which occurred later on in uh, 2017 in, uh, at a museum show in Lübeck that I was offered, I'll come to it later. It's one another highlight. Uh, I was uh, putting this uh, installation together and there you see the video lights. You see on the right painting, the exploration of the silver looking like an etching plate. I like the idea of uh, uh, remembering that metal plate and the writing and the texture. Here you get to see a view uh, from my studio uh, where, you know, I have various directions going all the time. Uh, one, uh, the left side, uh, it's the subtle memory line where I went back to black and white to make, uh, you know, at school the blackboard, you know, that semi white out um, um, chalk mark, which leaves another trace. Uh, and then, uh, you know, and then of course the right side, we have another glyph graph painting. Um, I'd like to uh, uh, show you this painting because uh, luckily at the time when I was making it, I actually also uh, uh, took details because each detail matters and look, this could make a painting in itself. Uh, so I find details very important. It makes me wonder, it makes me read, it makes me look, it makes me pay attention to these fine details. And uh, uh, so as uh, many, you know, as um, 
uh, a painting has a thousand words, many details can create other inspirations. And uh, here we have little uh, marks that uh, uh, I still would like to explore furthermore, but there you see that painting keeps on inspiring maybe another series, who knows. Here's an idea where, you know, the painting that really is closest to an etching plate uh, and um, how a painting to me is really also always relying to uh, a, a composition that wants to happen naturally. It's not forced, but somehow it's a, like an inner portrait, if you will. Something that happens, preoccupies me, will show up uh, as is, as within, so out there, the famous saying. And uh, now I would like to talk about a highlight that really came to me in a very unexpected way, a beautiful way. Um, Dagmar Teuber, she is a uh, medieval art expert uh, in Germany. And uh, we met at a private foundation and uh, she, she had organized a beautiful show. And then at one point we got to talk and she's asking me, what do I do? So I show her images and for her, what she saw in my work she suddenly noticed that there is a bridge for her to enter from the medieval space that she had been focusing on more into the contemporary. For her, there was a link into it. So um, we organized a meeting uh, many times. We, we met many times in Germany, but then uh, came a point. She asked me to bring a painting to Germany if I could. But as you can imagine, that's a bit difficult to fold up into a suitcase. So I invited her over to spend time with us and she ended up spending three weeks with us. And we were going through the archives that I had in my studio at my home. And when she was exposed to this whole journey, she decided, oh my goodness, I have to write a book. And she is the author of many other wonderful books, but mostly on medieval art. Here was an opportunity for her to write on somebody that does contemporary art. So here, uh, first one was at my studio and now, <laughs> She was, uh, for three weeks, she just put a book together that, uh, and we visited the Eno Gallery, of course, as well. There we have the painting again. And uh, we did, of course, a lot of talking. And ultimately, it resulted into a monograph that was published in 2017. Uh, and it's a bilingual uh, publication, uh, German and English. And Hermer Verlag is one of the biggest art book uh, publishers in Germany. So uh, as all this was happening, in the meantime, uh, the book was coming together, but she uh, got a new job as a curator at the museum uh, in Lübeck, northern, in northern Germany. That's one hour east of uh, Hamburg. And uh, she looked at the schedule and invited me to do a show during that summer of 2017 because there, there was nothing scheduled. So she was still so immersed in my work that it really uh, was perfect timing to do something with that. And um, she invited me to uh, pull my work together. Of course, as you can imagine, it yanked me out of my studio practice for a while because I had a lot of packing to do. Um, we gathered work from 1983 to 2016, uh, wrapped up here at my studio up on the upper left, and then uh, it got traded and then shipped over to Lübeck in, uh, you see that below. And this is what the beautiful museum looks on the outside. As you can see, an old uh, uh, architecture from the medieval times, but then the center had uh, a modern uh, um, uh, part uh, that was built on the old foundation uh, of a burnt down church. So here I'm showing how, uh, how much they went out because uh, for me, I, you know, Lübeck is the capital of marzipan. I know that old gate, it's from the 12th century from the marzipan packages that we grew up with every Christmas we received some. And here the bus shelters show the poster. Uh, it's like for me, uh, it was a great honor to see, uh, you know, that next to this monument because it's like having a poster next to the Eiffel Tower. It's a figure of speech. Um, the video that I showed you at the beginning of my presentation was streamed in the, in, uh, in the entrance hall of the museum part of uh, this, uh, the modern part where the show was exhibited. So that was the greeting. And uh, here you see the four floors are described. 
uh, where all the work was on display. And it started at the bottom with the early works. And then uh, Dagmar Teuber also was able to uh, borrow works from the National uh, Library uh, of Lübeck, uh, the city of Lübeck, um, as some old uh, books, uh, uh, open pages to actually connect the two uh, 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 worlds together. Uh, all I can tell you, what I experienced, it is a great honor to have been able to show my work uh, with words, uh, works from uh, the medieval times and on. Uh, what a rare opportunity I was offered. And uh, the, the, the connection just uh, showed me something else, how everything is connected, no matter, and how everything is timelessly connected. So that was a great, uh, I was so happy to see that. Uh, that I was able to do that. And uh, uh, the colors are, are somehow, uh, surprisingly to me, very uh, connected as well. You can see how the pages uh, resonate. Uh, and that was also a discovery to me. So we have uh, various periods. Each level uh, uh, had, a, had a group of paintings from various times. And uh, the further we went upstairs, uh, the more recent the work became. And uh, the show focused a lot on double page paintings because behind these gray walls, uh, that is where the book treasures were placed. I'll get to that. Because uh, they were not, uh, they had, had to have uh, special lighting. They couldn't sit in the bright rooms because it would actually damage the old manuscripts in the pages. So uh, that is how, that's how the curator decided to uh, solve the problem. And it also created a more intimate space because the viewer could then go in there and see closer comparison between what the curator saw, wanted to express uh, uh, using uh, both works, types of works. So the scribbles and, and my text studies, they started to converse. And in the abscess part, we actually put this installation that I had showed you earlier. And uh, the, uh, the installation piece uh, was also uh, instrumental to the uh, Conservatory of Music in Lübeck because uh, Dagmar Teuber invited the, the uh, professors there to pay attention to the show that took place here. And uh, you may recall the Sposen uh, uh, performance, well, that one was taken over by the music conservatory uh, into their uh, teaching curriculum, asking the students to interpret non-conventional uh, uh, notation. And they actually performed it. Uh, I had to offer them the structural notes, but uh, I was amazed that the structural notes actually triggered some comprehensive performance. And that too was an amazing experience. So um, just to conclude the highlight here, there's a section of a permanent, ex uh, the, the permanent collection of altars from the medieval times. Uh, when I saw this first, I uh, was prompted to, and I asked Dagmar if I could make a work in situ, which I put together uh, um, using my own typography work, the photography on the right. And I had taken photos, uh, close-ups from parts that really interested me, there you see me standing on the ladder. With the permission of the museum, I was allowed to do that, to take these open book sculptures that also, again, uh, illustrate how beautiful a simple line can be and how meaningful, uh, how meaningful it can become when placed into such context. And uh, these are the pieces that I decided to highlight on. And I have other examples here. Uh, you see the book, the apostle holding the book. And when I enlarged it, I noticed the scribbles, how a little scribble says so much. And I put it together with a detail from a painting of mine that I painted in 2002. And uh, I have to tell you a little story with that one. And a Tibetan monk came to visit us via our friend and asked me if I knew uh, Sanskrit. And I said, no. Well, this little doodle that I uh, placed on that canvas actually means life energy. In Sanskrit, it's pronounced pri. And I said, oh my God, I couldn't believe this. 
So there we go, life energy in a doodle, and I discovered that side in the old manuscript, uh, the sculpture as well. And these are the beautiful stands that the museum built to, for the display in these old parts. I think that the environment has really something magical to it and to be able to do that. So I'm very grateful for, to Dagmar uh, Teuber for uh, inviting me to uh, exhibit my work in that beautiful space. And uh, so the book came out at the same time, so it really accompanied uh, and uh, uh, so that was a great honor in itself to be able to thank the publishers in Frankfurt at the book fair. Uh, uh, so I move on to another uh, moment because, uh, and I'm almost coming to conclusion, uh, where uh, the typography invites me to uh, develop other lines in painting. I don't know how much time we have left. Oh, very oh, briefly. Least. Yes. Yes. Very briefly. Yes. So I'm just going to quickly show you. This is a, a co-creation with the Eno Gallery at the Robert Langen uh, in Waterloo, Ontario, where other works were placed together. So basically, this is where I work. And um, this is the space, what it looks like. I didn't tidy up when I take the photo. This is what my pails look like. Is what my garbage pails look like. And I'm sitting here with you sharing my journey and it's a great honor to do so and I want to thank you for listening. So we have very little time left, I realize that, so, but I'm still open for questions uh, if you have. The, the, the time that we constraint that we have is self-imposed. Uh, we can carry on as long as we like um, and so um, but uh, we'll, we'll certainly open it up for questions and comments. Uh, Richard, you, um, I'll go to you first. You've been typing away here. Over okay. to you. Hi, Alicia. Bravo. Really, really wonderful. Um, I love the, the exploration of, of uh, notation and text and music and all of that. And I, it just, it reminded me of one of, uh, uh, maybe not a formative art experience for me, but really, uh, you know, one of the most memorable ones. I remember running through the British Museum. I had just a few hours uh, coming from France to Canada. I, I, so I had a few hours to, before I had to go catch my flight. And I was trying to get to the Elgin Marbles, but then I'm running through the library and in all these cases, you know, there's just all this, all these scripts that I'm looking at. I look down and it's actually Beethoven, you know, his, his, his hand and notes and stuff. And uh, I mean, I was almost teary you know, seeing that. And, and then also then there's, you know, authors, Jane Austen and, you know, everything is just, it was really fantastic. And, and I think on that same trip at the, at the Tate Gallery, there was a big, um, one of the big chalky field paintings of Cy Twombly, you know, it was just a big white oh, yes. scribble across. And it reminded me of uh, growing up in, in, uh, in Manitoba in the winter when, you, you know, you'd be out of school for a week or two from the blizzards. And nice. uh, those were two really massive experiences for me. So it really, nice. this all related to that. Thank you. Thank you. That's a great, great uh, anecdote mm -hmm. to that, because I love Cy Trombley's work myself. So it's, uh, it's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nan, you had a comment, Nan? Open your mic, please, Nan. Uh, Nan, hold it, your microphone. OK. I've always been intrigued by your titles. And uh, in fact, I've scribbled a lot of them down because they were so uh, unusual. How do you come up with those? It takes, uh, it takes a while. It's a life experience. I pay attention to word formation and then when I can, if I don't forget them, I take note. I have a title book, a collection. Uh. And sometimes they actually create their own context. I mean, I have entire shows where suddenly there's a poem coming together because of the title alignment. And yes, it's serendipity. So I always love the word, so I, I, I pay attention to that. Right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. There are a number of you here, I think, who live with Elisa's work. Who has yep. some of her work? Nan, yep. you have some? I have two, and, yeah. And Kathy and Matt Manford, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, you, you've got uh, the text. Yeah, just... Sorry? Don't you have the text is still unwritten series? 
we have the series of the musical themes, which are beautiful. We just have a few up and others <laughs> uh, for later times to exchange. We always enjoy looking at them. And we, well, of course, I'm a bookie and I'm intrigued by all this topographical uh, background and uh, you know, evolution from illumination to uh, um, typography and uh, Arabic characters or whatever. And I, I see, compare this with my books. And of course, I collect books with graphic art and book artists, uh, livre d'artiste and everything, and have a lot of those. And, it's what I mostly enjoy. So I very much enjoy all of your work. Thank you, Manfred. Thank you. Yeah. I have to say that back in the day when I was a student at university, I was, uh, my graduate studies were in theology and history. And I focused a great deal on medieval and Renaissance art. And um, uh, for me, this marriage of text and painting has intrigued me to such a degree that I, I, I got a call from someone who's doing a doctoral thesis the other day, and they pointed out that we have more artists using text in their work than any other gallery they'd ever found. And I hadn't realized the extent to which, Elise is obviously uh, probably One of the pages, yeah. further than anyone else that I know, but um, this is something that uh, seems to happen a lot with artists that we represent, and it's, uh, it's a very interesting marriage of different parts of our brains, I think, are forced to come together in some way uh, by, right. by marrying text and, and Im visual imagery, or seeing text as visual imagery. Barb? Yeah. Hi, Barb. Hi, Alice, it's Barb Hogenauer. Just a comment, I own your book, Information, and being of German background, having that the juxtaposition of two languages is just so wonderful. I just cherish it and love it, and I just need you to know how much I really cherish it. Thank you. Thank you so much <laughs> for letting me know. We made sure that there were side by side because I love it too. So thank you so much for letting me know that. That's great feedback. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And thank you for illuminating us. I enjoyed this very much. Thanks William, for you so much for making comments. Yeah. Um, Elise, uh, I think you're very articulate um, in, in the way you explain your work. Um, it's an excellent presentation. Um, just, just one question. Um, it, it's sort of uh, all, all together. Um, obviously, there's a connection uh, to the movement of sound in your work. Um, do you have specific music in your mind when you create? And does your technique change with the, the music that you listen to? And in your work, do you, you try to manifest um, certain certain things that certain sounds in your, your head? And all of the above, I would say. Um, and it depends uh, which way I decide to focus. I mean, presently, and I've done it actually for the last five years, I tend to really I uh, want to listen, I play music while I work, but it is music that really um, is, uh, how can I describe it, it supports my heartbeat. Uh, it is uh, more uh, like um, upbeat and uh, some of it actually makes me go to my rebounds uh, and jump it out before getting back into that pace when I work. So it's really an atmosphere, it's an environment that I create. Um, it's um, uh, sometimes it's jazz, it's electro jazz uh, or contemplative music. Uh, I cannot listen to too serious music. I won't put John Cage on or Frank Zappa or that kind of stuff because that uh, music makes me have to sit down and listen. But I have to listen to myself while I work. So it's not that it is background music, but it is. Uh, it's energy. It's it's a sound energy that has a positive effect on me, and it's really about that energy field that I focus on. 
So, yeah. So I don't know. Yes. If I may, on behalf of us all, I would like to thank you for really uh, an intriguing presentation. So thank you very, very much. That was really terrific. Um, again, I learned a great deal. So thank you. Thank you so much, Carlin, for giving me this opportunity. Um, and thank you to everyone. Hello, Heidi. I noticed you joined. Thank you. I couldn't see anybody while I was doing my presentation, so I discover later on who is now. <laughs> and uh, uh, thank you all for joining me today. It's been a great honor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.